I'm going to try to, to say a few things about uh, where Kahneman money is going. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, U.S. Global Change Research Program. And, and I think that might be of great interest to you because it's where most of the funding for climate change research is taking place in the U.S. And it, it involves the programs of, of 13 agencies. And I'm the uh, chair of the re review committee for the National Academies of that, of that uh, uh, program because it, it essentially funds uh, all of the climate change research in the U.S. Uh, so I'll, uh, as I say here, my overview, but there's a, I'll give a brief history and I'll show some animations of, uh, of the of the new capabilities that we can do with climate modeling. And then I'll say a little bit about computational methods because in order to carry out these enormous calculations, we need to be able to exercise use of the latest and best supercomputers that, that are available. Then I want to get back to the, to, the, to, to the practical aspects, and that is environmental justice, for example. And then I'll talk a little bit about how this program started. I had the pleasure of being in the White House at the time. And uh, so let me start going. Now, first of all, from a satellite point of view, there are two things that are happening that are going to help on geographers and people who are engaged in climate change understand what's going on. And, and one of them is shown here, um, where we look at the, uh, from, from, from the airs, uh, uh, aqua and uh, our satellite system, where we look at carbon dioxide from space. And this is going to be a, a more and more increasing important aspect. Um, we can see on the lower tropospheric, we've got a CO2 increasing, and, and I superimposed on this graph a, um, on the Mauna Loa photoelectric, which shows the sawtooth pattern, so that we can understand on who is emitting carbon dioxide, and where it's coming from, and where it's being um, higher concentration versus lower. Up until now, we haven't really been able to sort of do that except for a few locations around the world. But now we'll have a geographical map of that. And uh, as a follow-on to, 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 uh, to that, we can actually superimpose from the airs, uh, excuse me, from the MODIS uh, instrument on the same satellite a, on the vegetation, which is shown in green here, and you will see that as the uh, as the vegetation grows in the summertime, it's in, the, in the spring and the summer, uh, it takes CO two out of the atmosphere, and then in the fall and winter, um, the vegetation dies and gives CO two back to the atmosphere, and we can actually see in a geographical way the the, the interaction between vegetation and the CO2. So this will give us another glimpse about what's going on in various places in the world. Now I'm going to say something about climate modeling. Uh, <clears throat> on the laws of physics and chemistry and, and, and biological processes can be expressed in terms of mathematical equations. Probably most precisely in terms of the physics and chemistry. I mean, biology is a little bit of a later addition to climate models. Uh, but these equations are, are of least for, the, for the, the dynamics and the thermal dynamics of the atmosphere and the oceans. We've known about these equations for a long time. And we have to express this in terms of mathematical equations and then uh, put them into a form that can be solved by modern com computer systems. Also, we have to uh, treat on the 
physical processes such as precipitation, radiation, solar and terrestrial, and, and boundary layer uh, transfers of heat, momentum, and moisture at the Earth's surface, at the Earth's surface also have to be included. And then we can do experiments on changing forcings of the greenhouse gases, or the volcanic or the sulfur variations. And typically, uh, uh, most state-of-the-art climate models include all of these processes to some degree. I wanted to point out that, uh, you know, that all of these uh, advances really came from previous researchers of, of, of various backgrounds. Uh, I've written down on the, on the basic mathematical equations for the ocean and for the atmosphere here. I won't go through them in, in, in detail, but I want to point out that in the upper left-hand corner, uh, is, is B. Birkins, who wrote down these equations mathematically in 1904. Now, now nobody attempted to solve those equations in their, in their raw form. They always had to simplify them in various ways. And then, uh, however, um, there was a stubborn Englishman by the name of L. Albert, shown here, who was a Quaker during World War I. And, and the wars in World War I were sort of episodic. They were, the people would stay in the trenches and then they would climb out of the trenches and, and battle every week or so and then and they would go back down to the trenches. Well, he was a Quaker and he didn't want to participate in the, in the war as a, as a soldier, so he was an anthemist. Lots of free time, so he, he picked out a particular place in France to do his calculation for one place, only one geographical place, uh, and he had a hand calculator. So he ground out the calculations over several years, <laughs> and, turned out, and turned out to, to not be a, a good forecast because. Uh, he wasn't aware of some of the limitations on how to solve these equations. But he did a map out in a book, which is very popular, uh, which explained exactly how to do this on this sort of uh, calculation. Uh, however, on the real serious attempt came from Jewel Charney on the first electronic computer in 1949 and 1950, where he simplified these on this set of equations, and and the first forecast that he and his and his team of scientists and programmers did was as good as as any uh, empirical one done by humans, and so it was viewed as a success and it launched on the on the prediction of the weather. And uh, another scientist, uh, uh, Norm Phillips, right here, uh, took this model and, and adapted it by putting in a heating function where you have heating in the tropics and cooling in the, in the north, uh, are in the cold region. In his case, it was really the hemispheric model, but, but he put in the heat source and the cooling source, and he was able to, to, to generate Barophonic waves and the typical high and low pressure systems that we see in, in everyday weather. So uh, I think uh, I and other, <coughs> others came into this sort of thing. I started in 1959 as a young uh, scientist, as a mathematician at Stanford in a summer job, and I thought this was a great area to get into, and I applied for. Program at Penn State. Uh, so I've been with it for a long time. Um, I won't go through this one in detail either. Uh, I just want to point out that, that basically all of the features that you can imagine uh, that go on in the climate system are, are in one way or another included. For example, 
example, cumulus clouds, cirrus clouds, stratus clouds, precipitation in the form of either rain or, or, or snow. Uh, you know, we have river flow vegetation, we have currents in the ocean, uh, and we have radiation from the sun and outgoing radiation top of the atmosphere. And all of these now are, 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 are a part of any, any climate model. In the 1960s, you know, we just had atmospheric and very simple land model uh, with, with hardly any, any detail. Uh, and the oceans were very viscous and, and didn't really have realistic ocean currents and so forth. I'll skip over to the far right and just point out the, all of this alphabet soup of, of, of com, com, components now is a, is, is a typical ingredient for uh, a uh, climate model. Uh, on the last one down here is that we're putting in ice sheets and there's, there's a tough problem there because of the time scale. <coughs> We typically run climate models for periods of, of months to centuries, but not thousands of years. But we're getting into thousands of years with some of our low-resolution versions of the model so that we can reproduce the last 20,000 years in our climate models. Uh, we have a scientist at, at NCAR, and his name is Betty Otto Bleesman, who has been blazing trails for and working with, with many academic colleagues on, on trying to understand the past climates. And in the early days when we used a latitude and longitude type grid, and we're going now to things like a soccer ball type and using uh, a, a spectral element method which can be run on thousands of processors uh, of our supercomputers types. And you get a fairly uniform resolution. The problem with latitude and longitude is you're concentrating a lot of resolution right near the pole, so, which is okay, but not ideal. Ideal is to have a more uniform resolution. And there's some other contenders of, of grids. Shown here. We are presently trying to do experiments with uh, a 25 kilometer grid. And I show this part of the eastern US, which shows the virtually how we can get down to the sub county level in many ways. And that uh, we're running these versions of the model right now in the test in the testing form. But this will, will give geographers and other scientists who are interested in more detail. And, and it allows us to put in the mountains and the coastlines in a much more accurate way. Uh, so um, resolution doesn't solve everything, but it does help in, in representing on, on the true geographical measure of the, of the world. In the vertical world, we typically have a grid system that uh, uh, has a transformed grid so it's going to be represent the shape of the, uh, of the mountains. And then as we go up to higher levels, it switches over to a pressure surfaces. And, and this allows us to actually put a stratospheric model in, or, or I should say, on the stratospheric processes into our model in a more realistic way. And uh, it seems to work fairly well. Now, I, now here again, I won't go into the details, but this is, is what uh, kind of land and vegetation models have gotten to be, where we have something like 30 species of plants. And um, we include very complicated and, and hopefully more realistic ways of treating vegetation, for example, precipitation falling on the, on the leaves, the leaves fall off in the winter and the fall, the fall and winter, and you get uh, uh, that 
filtration and sublimation on the surface. Um, you have exchange of carbon dioxide uh, going in, in and out of the plants. And, uh, uh, and we have all kinds of biochemical cycles taking place all the way from methane to carbon dioxide to, to nitrous oxide and all of these, you know, of these processes. I might add that we've been, been tackling a problem, I think we have a, a partial sort of solution is that, uh, just to give you an example of the complexities that, we, that we're facing, on the Amazon was drying out too much. And it turned out that we had, uh, as it dried out in certain spots in the Amazon, it would initiate uh, 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 forest fires in our, in our treatment in the model. And it would burn up all the leaves uh, and the vegetation, and then it got drier if there was a kind of a positive feedback. And I think that we, we figured out a little bit better way of doing that. Because in the Amazon, you have thunderstorms all the time generating lightning, but then you get a chain of events and feedbacks that can go wild in the model. And we uh, improved on that as of this week, <laughs> I might add. So uh, if you look at the, at the bottom figure, are we take into account glacier melt, rivers that flow from the land into the ocean, and the changing of the, of the, of the chemistry of the oceans. Here I want to show a fairly high resolution, even higher than, than, than what I showed that grid for earlier, where uh, we're essentially uh, getting uh, uh, a good look at tropical storms, hurricanes. Um, we don't get down to tornadoes in these models, but we get down to various types of hurricanes. Here I just want to show, uh, here's a, 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 a group of, of basically showing on the water vapor. Here's a hurricane right here going into the Gulf. And if you look at this more closely, Magnified it up, it would have an open center uh, in the center of that hurricane. But this is the water vapor, and, and of course, the largest stratosphere of the water vapor are in the tropics. Now, here's two hurricanes, and at some point, when they start rotating around each other, that's called the Fujiwara uh, effect, which is well known when two hurricanes kind of do a little dance around each other and then they merge. Uh, <clears throat> and if we can, if you can also do the same thing for the oceans. Here's an ocean of, of 10 to 12 kilometers over the, the, the oceans. You can see the Gulf Stream coming up uh, on the coast of Florida to the Carolinas. And then, it, then it separates and then goes into the Atlantic. Uh, and you see eddies that are being shed off the, from the Gulf Stream as, the, as it meanders. The same is true of the, of the, of the curved shield turned off the coast of Japan. Uh, you get eddies that strongly, uh, strongly linked along the equator from El, El Nino to Here's a La Nina forming right here. And, and here, I just want to point out that we have eddies everywhere. They are ubiquitous. And the only way you can capture the strong currents and the eddies is to go to very high resolution. So uh, I, 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 we've done some exploratory short runs with this very high resolution model, and it is quite realistic in terms of capturing the basic motions of both the atmosphere and the ocean. So this will be the future, I think. Now here is a, a animation from NASA using a climate model. Uh, and what you're looking at is, is different types of aerosols. This is the aerosols from the, from, from the dust of the Sahara. 
going into the Caribbean and be a big anti-social success. On these white uh, uh, areas here are sulfur dioxide, which is, is, is from the generation of, of energy from fossil fuels. And you see lots of it over here in China. On the, on the greenish area down here is carbon aerosols uh, generated from biomass burning in, in, in most of South America and Africa and also Indonesia. And, 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 and those white aerosols down here are, are essentially from uh, on, on the generation of sea spray which, which dries and has uh, various sulfur compounds in, in it, and it generates here. So we are able to, to, to generate gener uh, generally good sort of details in the aerosol distributions. Uh, and that this is, is increasingly being incorporated in, into standard climate models. Now, here I show uh, for, for tropical storms uh, the, the difference in between observations. Observations are in this top one here, and the computer simulation of, of, of uh, tropical storms and hurricanes is in the lower one. I show uh, tropical storms over here, you can see sort of where they form in the tropics and in the, uh, in the higher latitudes. <clears throat> and we, do, and we, we uh, use something called the, the Saffron uh, and Simpson scale. And then we, we, we get a pretty good distribution uh, of the two, in, the, in other words, in between uh, sort of where the, the location is and the observations up here. <clears throat> now, if you look at hurricanes, and we use criteria for when a hurricane our, our tropical storm turns into a hurricane. Um, we also get a pretty good correlation between the observation and, and the model. And then finally, uh, there's a category of hurricanes called intense hurricanes, and we also get those uh, in this sort of simulation. So this gives us confidence that we are, for the first time, being able to generate hurricane and hurricane uh, tracks that are, that are fairly close to the observations. And we haven't been able to, to, to do this because our, our models were too coarse resolution to, to include. <clears throat> the same is true with respect to observations and uh, of the El Nino and La Nina. <coughs> Here's from the model versus observation. This is a, 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 on the either the, the warming or the cooling of the, of the uh, eastern Pacific. On the red is El Nino. On the this is the El Nino, and the blue are the El Nino, are the La Nina statistics. And you can see in our model we get a pretty good sampling of the Pacific. Although there is a tendency for the El Nino and the La Nina to be a little bit too strong, but but basically it was the same sort of distribution and, and statistics, and so this is also another achievement. Not not only of our model, but other models have similar sorts of things. Early days, we didn't didn't get all the details of La Nina. For, for lots of reasons. Now, uh, as we, as I mentioned earlier, as we try to couple our models to uh, to look at glacier flow over Greenland, for example, and, which actually is measured in terms of meters per year, the observations are on the left, and a five-kilometer resolution <coughs> model uh, is shown on the right. And you can see that the, the, the 
that, that the model uh, captures on the main uh, flows of the, of the glaciers as they move uh, to, uh, to the coast. And uh, I think this is important uh, to sort of verify our models without being uh, coupled in. We, so we first do a standalone calculation, and this is what is shown here. So I think this gives us some hope of uh, being able to include on the, on the, on the glacier flow. Uh, our group had a kind of a little bit of a breakthrough that was reported in the news, uh, I think about th four months ago. One of our young scientists, Haiyan Ting, uh, tried to answer the question of um, what effects on the probability of heat waves, and heat waves are going to be very important as we go into a warmer climate. And she found that this, uh, that, that Typically, on, on wave number five, in other words, five waves around the globe, which is a wave that actually propagates towards the west. It's not like this regular storm waves, which go to the east. Uh, on this wave, it seems to be fairly dominant in the observation as well as in the models. And so you can imagine, as this wave propagates to, to the west, uh, if you form a ridge like this, you have a heat wave, and if that wave is, uh, is coming uh, from, from the east and going, going to the west, and its pattern sets up with a, a, a heat wave, it can make that heat wave last a lot longer, and therefore uh, increase on the length and, and the intensity of the heat wave. So it really kind of gives people who are doing seasonal forecasting in the summertime some uh, a better idea of how to how to improve uh, on the forecasting of heat waves. Now I want to shift to environmental justice. I I show this child on the uh, with the world painted on his face. And this child represents, I, I think, on the next generation that has to deal with, with climate change. And the climate models can, uh, and earth system models, have and will continue to contribute to understanding and predicting of the climate system. They allow the science com com community to determine objectively the possible impacts of climate change on food production, flooding, droughts, sea level rise and health, as well as, as, as getting just the effective decision and support for the politicians. Higher resolution and more complete models. Now, it's interesting, if we look at, at the issue of public trust, you can see it at the, at the top, our military is high, medicine, scientific community are fairly high, and then at the bottom, the press isn't very high. Banks and financial institutions aren't very high. Congress is not very high. And, and the television media is not very high. And then uh, I won't go into the details. But uh, all of this is to point out that we have a perception problem, uh, which isn't getting much better, in some ways it's getting worse. And, <clears throat> and we, we're dealing with the Congress that doesn't want to even de de debate on the President's climate action plan in a constructive way. Now the genesis of the U.S. Global Change Program actually happened uh, under the tenure of, of of uh, George H. H. W. Bush, and uh, when there were a lot more sort of moderate Republicans, I might add, and uh, <clears throat> he had his uh, chief of 
staff with John's uh, uh, Nunu, and the uh, president science advisor was uh, Alan Bromley. Uh, Alan Bromley invited me to come to the White House to, to speak to the cabinet. This was 19, uh, 1990. I, I did it along with uh, Dan Aldred, who was an observational scientist uh, and, and a very good friend. And uh, he and I spoke to them. Uh, and we had the heads of all of the, of the, of the agencies involved in, in uh, atmospheric and ocean, EPA, and, and so forth in that meeting. And what was so impressive about that meeting was uh, uh, is that Alan Bromley did a very clever thing to, to sort of make things work. He went around, the, after our presentations, he went around the room asking each of the heads of that agency, will you sign on to doing a, a, a research program on climate change? And they said yes, everyone on, around the table. And that was key to getting things started. And actually, Congress passed a law, which turned out to be quite good. I'll, I'll say something about that in a minute. As a side issue, when I was there, uh, Alan Bromley took me to see John Sanudo, and uh, he didn't tell me what, what he, uh, John Sanudo wanted. Uh, I, <coughs> So, so when John started talking to me, and I had some correspondence with him about climate change, because he, he misquoted me in Newsweek, um, you know, that climate change isn't going to be very important because the world's oceans are going to take up the heat. And I pointed out to, it wasn't on the case that the upper, only the very upper part of the ocean is going to warm up over, say, a century or a couple century time scale. But he was very insistent on, can you give me a climate model I can run in my office? I thought that was rather strange. <laughs> we were all running on Cray computers at the time. <laughs> and I've been in his office, which isn't as big as his table. And offices are very crowded, except for the Oval Office in the White House. And, uh, but we argued and I agreed to give him uh, a climate model, a simple one, a one-dimensional climate model that he could run on his compact 386 computer. <laughs> and, and he actually did a Fortran, so he, he, uh, <laughs> he got the model. <laughs> That's another interesting story. But anyway, um, I've already told you that I talked to the cabinet. <clears throat> and anyway, on the U.S. Global Change Research Program, it's $2.7 billion now. It involves, actually, I say 12 agencies. I, I stand on correct, it's 13 agencies. And it's coordinated through, through the, the uh, Office of of science and technology policy, in other words, the, on the science advisor's office, and, and with OMB. Uh, and I, as I said, I chair of the review committee for the National Academies, and we just met on Monday and Tuesday of this week. But, but it actually was a good plan. It called for a comprehensive and, and integrated U.S research program which will assist the, the nation and the world to understand and assess and predict and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. And it emphasized research into the vulnerabilities in human and natural systems and relationships to climate extremes, thresholds, and tipping points. Now, all these are issues that organization, AAG, are involved in. And I, I'm amazed at, at how many people who have uh, geographical uh, backgrounds can make contributions to 
to do all the words. And it was passed by a bipartisan Congress in 1990. I don't think it would get passed in this Congress, unfortunately. I won't go through the details of all of that, but, 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 but there is a mechanism. There's, there's all sorts of committees and subgroups out of this that are helping coordinate all of this research across to all of these agencies. And, uh, and I think that uh, if you look at these titles, you can see geography looms as a, as a big aspect. I just want to point out, and I'll use very briefly, of the goals, uh, and I won't go through all of the detail, I'll just say that our number one goal is to advance the science. Number two is to inform decisions. And, and, and number three is to conduct sustained assessments. And, and number four is to communicate and to educate the public as well as policymakers. And so, all of that is happening. So uh, the on the strategic plan and the, and the priorities are always changing as we advance on the science. Uh, now some of these have various outcomes, and I, here again I won't go through each one of these. But but I'm I'm hoping that we can build a more integrated observational and modeling program. At the time I got started in modeling, uh, there were only about four or five groups in the world, and the groups were of the order of five or six people. Now, when we have workshops uh, for our group, that involves uh, 350 scientists and, and programmers. So that there are a lot more people engaged, including the students and postdocs. So, uh, we're hoping that we can keep advancing our, our knowledge of the Earth and the human system and how they're integrated. And, um, and hopefully, uh, the countries of the world, including the U.S., can start moving towards dealing with this problem in a more serious way. I heard them earlier on this week that the National Climate Assessment is, is expected to be released sometime in May or June. It's an 1,100-page document, which is going to be an invaluable resource for state planners, for, for business, for, for uh, uh, health people who are, who are doing studies. And so all of these different sectors of our society are going to benefit from this National Climate Assessment. And I might point out that, that, that they've really done it in a more modern way, in the sense that, that you can get it electronically on your computer. So uh, as you're you know, reading a particular section, if you don't know what the word is in terms of its meaning, click on and then it it'll take you to another section of the report which defines what that term is uh, on the background of it. Yes. And so people who are easily trying to think or at least more easily trying to find out how they're affected or businesses or, or different sectors of our society can 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 get that information more effectively than in the past. Thank you very much for inviting me, and also uh, I'm, I'm deeply honored to get this very prestigious award from your, your society. Thank you.